in the spring, we get a lot of wild onions and New Zealand spinach growing in the garden. I love to use them both in the kitchen and for fresh spring recipes that I'm so excited to share with you in this video. On the first day, I'm making a spring risotto with salmon cakes. You can see me here cutting up those wild onions in small pieces and we have so much of them that I can actually afford to not use all of them. I am adding to a large pot the zero acre oil that I featured in another video that many of you didn't like but we still love it and use it quite a bit for high heat frying. To that I'm adding my chopped onions and I love that it they have these white and green and in between shades of color and it makes it so fresh and spring-like. I'm sauteing them until they're just soft. They're not going to be translucent like regular onions, but they're going to be soft and they're going to lose a little bit of their vibrant color. Next, I'm adding the risotto rice. It's just a short round grain white rice. I've used brown rice, but it just doesn't work so well for a risotto. And while I love using whole grains and whole grain recipes, I prefer the white rice. Then I'm adding some white wine. This is just a very inexpensive Italian Pinot Grigio. And if you're not using wine, you can always skip it and move on to the next ingredient that I am adding. The idea here is to saute the rice a little bit and then let the rice and the onions soak up all the white wine. And next I'm adding some homemade bone broth. As I said, if you're not using white wine or you don't have it or you don't want to use it, you can always just use a bunch of bone broth instead. It will just be as delicious, however, I'm not worried at all about adding wine because it just imparts so much flavor and all the alcohol is going to be cooked out by the time you're serving this dish. Risotto is something that you cannot hasten up. You have to let it do its thing. And as you can see, I cooked it until everything was soaked up and evaporated before I'm adding just a little bit more. And yes, this is one of those recipes where there's a lot of stirring and tending and maintaining, but it is so worth the effort in my mind. For a little addition of protein, I'm making salmon cakes. I'm using sockeye salmon that has, I know, the skin and the bones on it. They are perfectly edible. If you are not a big fan of those, even though they are not just edible, but they're actually really good for you, you can also get boneless and skinless canned salmon. It's just a really easy way to add some healthy protein to this dish. And also the flavor of the salmon so complements the risotto or the other way around. I'm adding an egg that will help to bind the salmon cakes and then some homemade breadcrumbs. As you can see, I'm not measuring. I'm just going by hmm, the way it looks. I always like to call myself the queen of eyeballing. But once you've made this recipe a few times, and I'll leave a link for you below because I do have that on my blog, you will get a feel for it. Then I chopped up some green asparagus and I am mostly just adding the bigger chunks on the bottom and while this is still cooking, I want the asparagus to soften up a little bit and lose some of its crunch. For a little bit of protein and another pop of green color, I'm adding frozen peas. I like those better than the canned peas because they tend to be a little bit mushy and they add just a little bit of extra crunch. And when I'm making the salmon cakes, I like to make them fairly small. Obviously you can make them whatever size you like, but the smaller ones obviously cook a little faster and I think they're really cute little dollar dollops and it's really easy to form them. You don't even need to moisten your hands. In another skillet, I added some oil and the 
trick to using cast iron and make it nonstick is first to heat the cast iron, then add the oil, let the oil become hot, and then add whatever you're frying here, my salmon cakes. And I like to flatten them just a little bit more because they cook faster and they did seem a little bit higher than I first thought when I made them. Spreading the oil around a little bit, even though we straightened out the floor and leveled it, it doesn't seem to be 100% level. Once they're cooked on one side, just takes a few more minutes, I flip them around and brown them on the other side. They're actually gonna cook really fast. This is why you can do that pretty much towards the end of making your risotto and the two of them go really well together, both in terms of timing and taste. To make the risotto taste even better, I add a good helping of butter. I wanna let that melt down and some freshly grated Parmesan cheese that makes it just a little bit more creamy and adds that umami rich flavor to the risotto and it makes it a little bit more substantial. As I said, lots of stirring here and it's just very meditative to get that all together. Good helping of fresh ground pepper and some salt. Obviously you wanna taste it depending on what your bone broth is seasoned like. And then to brighten it up, I like to add just a little bit of lemon juice. Again, give all of that a good stir and do try it because everybody is different and you wanna make sure it's seasoned just right. And to serve it up, I'm adding the risotto to a pasta bowl or like a deep plate and then some salmon cakes on the side here. And that is the dinner for a first night. The second night I am making a spring quiche with goat cheese and vegetables. You can make a quiche crustless or you can decide to make a crust just like I am doing today with einkorn. And I don't think I'm following a recipe here. I'm just kind of going by feel. So I'm adding the all-purpose einkorn flour. You can use regular all-purpose flour or spelt flour. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can make this. Some avocado oil and then just a little bit of water. I'm mixing all of that up and I am really just going for consistency here. I can always add a little bit more of one or the other or the other, meaning I can always add a little bit more flour or avocado oil or you can also use butter. I just didn't have enough butter today and that's why I used avocado oil. I guess I need a little bit more flour. It's a little bit too sticky. I want it to be soft and basically like a pie crust. If you've ever made a pie crust before, you probably know what that consistency looks like and mostly feels like. And I know it's always a little bit risky to try something new while the camera is recording, but I decided, you know what? I think I can do this today and I am very happy to report that the final product turned out very delicious. You can always follow a recipe if you're not quite sure about the ratios or the ingredients, but I often like to wing it. And with a lot more experience, the more often you make something, the more confident you become. And then at some point, you might also be just like me and try things on the fly. Now I wanna roll out my pastry crust here and for that I'm using my rolling pin and it's actually pretty simple to roll it out into a round shape. I think I'm gonna go a little bit too big here in the end for my cooking vessel, but again, that doesn't matter because in the end it just tasted beautifully and sometimes the presentation is only half of it. And just for our family, I don't care. I am a lot less worried and less stressed about making it look perfect. This is not, I'm trying not to win some food contest on Instagram, <laughs> but I'm just making food for a family. It is 
pouring rain and I'm going to find those spring onions as I told you earlier. They're all over our garden in the spring and I really love using them in as many recipes as I can because I do believe in seasonal eating. There is something about what certain plants provide at certain seasons that really support the body and the wild onions have a great combination between a bit of a garlic flavor and a subtle onion flavor more like a spring onion than a regular onion obviously when you harvest something from the garden you get a lot of soil on it and it's never going to be just as pretty as when you buy it from the store but that's also the beauty of it and you know it is just so fresh you can never buy anything as fresh as that in the store cutting off the roots here and a little bit of soil actually if that's still stuck to the wild onions it doesn't matter so much and it does have some probiotics and b vitamins in there that you often just end up supplementing to your diet again chopping the onions into really small pieces here dicing the onions and you can even eat the flowers or you can use them to decorate your recipe afterwards whatever you like i highly encourage you to seek those out if you can or let them grow in your garden or maybe even try to find them and you have never noticed them before then i have some bell peppers that i found in the fridge i am a big believer in just opening my fridge and seeing what's in there that's why i often don't follow recipes and again over time you get a good feel of what goes well together and what doesn't but for my quiche here i thought the yellow and orange and red peppers would add both nice color and a little bit of crunch for the quiche base i'm cracking some eggs into a bowl and to make things really easy for me and to cut down on cleanup, I use it the same bowl that I used for the dough for my quiche base. And that cuts down on cleanup and just a little bit efficient. And yeah, why not, right? Because whether <laughs> the mixture touches the dough or you get some on your egg mixture, it shouldn't matter. I think I have to fish out a little bit of a piece of eggshell Nobody likes that kind of crunch in their food. So sometimes I need to actually put on glasses and find those little bits and pieces. Anyhow, breaking up the egg yolks, mixing all of that together. Then I have some sour cream. A lot of people use regular cream for quiche. I always love sour cream. It's a fermented cultured product. So it has some health, health benefits. <laughs> but it also has a deeper flavor than just regular cream. And to get the most out of my container here, I love using a silicone spatula. It really makes it easy to recycle it because you don't have to rinse it quite as much, but it also gets the most out of it. And sometimes with a spoon, you can't get everything out of it. Now the star here in this recipe is the fresh goat cheese that is one of my favorite ingredients to use in the springtime because it has cheesy and salty and umami and fresh flavors that all come out really well in this spring quiche recipe i think i'm going to use all of it first i thought that that log that we get at costco in a two-pack it's really inexpensive was enough but i'm just going to use the whole log here now I could have used a softer goat cheese or let it sit out at room temperature for a while before making this recipe. Now, of course, I know that, um, but at the time the goat cheese was fresh from the fridge and still pretty firm. Then I'm adding some alpine herbal salt that a good friend of mine gave to me. Now I have to try to transfer the pie crust into my cast iron skillet. It's well seasoned. That's why I don't have to do anything to it. And I'm going to put it in there. I could have gone a less high, but if you're making recipes on the fly, you don't really know how high everything is going to end up. And maybe I could have used either a smaller 
cast iron skillet. This is a 10 and a quarter inch, or I could have made the pie crust not quite as high. You'll see in the end what I'm talking about. I'm adding the spring onions, the wild onions to the bottom, and then the diced bell peppers right on top. And as you can see, this looks so fresh and so colorful and is very healthy. Right on top, I'm adding my egg cheese mixture and I wanna make sure that all the vegetables are covered. That helps to cook them evenly and to make sure that they're not scorched on one side when you're baking the spring quiche in your oven. My spatula comes in handy again, getting all the egg mixture out of the bowl. Again, spreading the cheese around. Like I said, it was a little bit too firm here for my taste, but oh well. So this goes in the oven at 375 degrees until the entire cheese mixture has set and it is golden brown right on top. To plate it up, I cut it into wedges and you can see that I have some avocado back there that was just perfectly ripe and I'm adding that on the side to this dish. The avocado makes us a little bit more filling and you can always add some protein to it and then I have some spring sprouts, some broccoli sprouts that I had growing in my windowsill that I added on top just for some more vitamins. On day three, I am making a roasted carrot tart, if you will, with ricotta and pine nuts. And here are my multicolored carrots. I love using my vegetable peeler, Swiss vegetable peeler. I'm leaving a link for that in the description box for you. It makes peeling the carrots such an easy job and it doesn't take more peel off than necessary. And here is my favorite part the purple carrots that have this yellow inside and they're just so pretty. As I'm cutting the carrots lengthwise into quarters, some of the thinner ones I may have not had to cut quite in quarters. I could have just halved them, but that's okay. And then I'm sprinkling the zero acre cooking oil over it and I will roast them in the oven at 400 degrees until they are caramelized and brown and really soft but carrots won't really get soft they will just get tender for the ricotta base i am using ricotta here and i'm just adding a good helping now this is a recipe that i had seen somewhere and i thought oh this is a good inspiration but i ended up varying the recipe a whole lot because i thought it was a little bit too sweet for my taste because you add a little bit of maple syrup. Now I use just a dash just to make it a tad sweet, but the ricotta is already pretty sweet. From our garden, we have some Meyer lemons that I'm zesting right into it. And in the end, I added a lot more zest. And here you can see that I am juicing the lemons. Now our Meyer lemons have a lot of seeds in them which is pretty typical for something that you grow in your garden store-bought varieties are often seedless and you don't have to hassle with them but i love using what we grow and i have to catch the seeds on a little spoon to make sure they don't end up in <laughs> the dish and a little bit of chili flakes some black fresh ground pepper giving that a good stir. And then, as I said before, you definitely want to taste it and make sure it is to your liking. For the crust, I'm also using a sourdough recipe. And again, I am not using a recipe. I'm just winging it with some avocado oil. I'm adding my sourdough starter. And again, I'm just going with how I want the dough to feel to my hands sourdough starter, a little bit of salt. It's always a good addition and mixing that up to incorporate the salt so it doesn't pool in any areas. And I'm adding some water because I want a little bit more than I have with just the 
sourdough starter that I used there. And again, mixing that all up in my bowl here. And like I said, I feel pretty comfortable winging recipes, kind of making them up. Sometimes I find it's a little bit more trouble to actually find a recipe. Oftentimes, yes, even though I love old fashioned cookbooks, I have my phone there and then my phone goes black. So I have decided that sometimes it just is easier for me to make up a recipe as I'm going. And again, I have often enough made recipes like that. So I do have a pretty good idea what that should look like. I am making a good dough here. I want it to be soft and not sticky and deciding whether I need to add a little bit more flour or not. And at some point I might just use my hands again, both to knead it better, but also to really get my hands on it and to feel what the dough feels like in my hands. With experience, that is really valuable. And I don't think that my grandmother oftentimes used recipes. They just had a few recipes that they're making all the time and had them so pat down that they were so comfortable just making them on the fly. And if you ever went to your grandmother and asked them for a certain recipe, they probably had to sit down and think hard, like giving you measurements and cups and grams and whatnot, because like I said, they just add a little bit more this and add a little bit more that. Here I'm adding a little bit more flour because my dough is still feeling a little bit more sticky than I want. I still want it soft, but not too sticky that it's clinging to the bowl. However, sometimes with sourdough, you may know that to develop the gluten, you have to knead it a little bit. And I'm almost doing a little bit like mini stretch and folds here. That is something that I just decided to do as I was kneading this dough, but I'm also going to let it rest at some point that it can relax a little bit and absorb the moisture and become the kind of dough that I want it to be. And once I'm happy with the feel and the look of it, I want it to be very uniform and soft and soft on the outside. I will use both of my hands to form a uniform dough ball and to roll it up a little bit more. You can see that in just a moment here again, stretching the outside a little bit and rolling the bottom of it under and shaping that into a round ball that will now rest because I am using the sourdough as a leavening and I'm not adding any baking powder or any yeast or anything else to this. That's why I'm relying on the sourdough to do the lifting of the leavening for this recipe. To let that rise in a warm spot, I cover it with a kitchen towel and let it sit until I'm ready to use it. Now, when I'm ready to roll it out and on a warm day, this can be a couple hours later. I didn't use a whole bunch of flour. If you want it properly fermented, you might want to let it sit a little bit longer or have it rise in the refrigerator for about eight hours. Now, this was a warm enough day that I felt pretty comfortable using it after a few hours. And again, maybe some of the flour wasn't all properly fermented. With a little bit more flour on my work surface, I will roll it out into a rectangle because I am using the same baking glass dish that I'm using for roasting the carrots to actually make my tart. And I have an idea how big my roasting pan is, my glass dish, and that's what I'm gonna stretch out the dough. And it feels pretty good under my hands. I have to say I'm pretty happy. Like sometimes it's risky to do this on camera when you've never done this before. And obviously I cannot, I can decide to not use the footage if it just didn't turn out well, but I'm really happy when I am winging something and it actually turns out good enough that I can use it for this video. Here are the roasted carrots. I'm transferring them back to the bowl that I used for my pie crust. And they're really steaming hot, which is why I can't use my hands for them. And now I will carefully 
transfer my crust, my base into this baking dish. And one of the beautiful things about using this glass baking dish while it's still hot is that the crust will start cooking right away. However, in one spot you can see here the um, I, on the camera it's going to be the top left uh, the bottom left corner the dough got a little bit stuck on and it wasn't too bad but if I was a little bit more perfectionist that would have bothered me a little bit more. Here I'm spreading my ricotta maple lemon mixture over the bottom here and if you like it very creamy you can make a little bit more and if you just like a touch of the ricotta with the carrots you can always decide to use a little bit less. Then I arrange the carrots and the tops of the carrots are a little bit smaller than the bottoms which is why I had them facing in and then I'm sprinkling some pine nuts over it. they will roast you can also use almonds or walnuts if you can't find any pine nuts or if they're too expensive in your area and then this goes back in the hot oven until it is set let's see what it looks like it smells amazing the pine nuts are golden brown and then I'm just adding some chopped parsley that I chopped before when I have a lot and freeze in these Ziploc bags. It just makes any recipe look a lot fresher and it adds just a dash of vitamins. With some salad on the side, this was our dinner. And for my fourth night, I'm making a green shakshuka. If you haven't heard about it, don't worry, I'll show you exactly how to make it. Here is my red thread, if you will, for all these recipes. And that is my wild onions from the garden. You know what I'm doing. I'm heating my cast iron skillet. I'm heating the oil and then I am sauteing the wild onions just until they're soft. Stirring them a little bit and adding some chili flakes, paprika powder and smoked paprika. I love the combination of the two. And this is the New Zealand spinach from our garden. I started growing it and now it's growing like weeds. If you haven't heard about New Zealand spinach, you can grow it, you can get seeds. And like I said, it, we love using it and it's just like regular spinach. You can use it just the same. However, it seems to grow really well in our area. And here I'm just waiting for the spinach leaves to wilt down a little bit and settle. I'm adding a dash of apple cider vinegar. This really helps brighten up this whole dish. Add a lid and let the spinach wilt. To add a little bit of substance and backbone to this, I'm adding a can of white beans. And this is such a fast way to cook a meal with some extra protein from the pantry. Mixing that all together. I just want the beans to heat up. They're already fully cooked. That's the beauty of it. That's make, that makes this dish actually come together pretty fast. Now I'm creating these little welds here and cracking a egg into every well. That's the, I guess that's a shachuka park. There's red chachukas and I'm making this green one. It's a really interesting and yummy way to create a, let's say, new dish and use some ingredients that you already have at home. The egg goes in the well here. I'll put a lid on because I want the eggs to set. You can cook them a little bit more or less depending on your preference. In a separate small cast iron skillet, I'm melting butter and tomato paste that I kept in the freezer. I'm adding crumbled feta cheese on top of the green shakshuka. You could guess, I guess you can use any cheese here. And then I sprinkle the tomato butter over the shakshuka and here it is. Thank you so much for watching and I will look forward to seeing you in the next video.